Take two. Good morning again, friends from <laughs> all over the world. Uh, thank you for being here on time. Uh, today, oh, earlier, well, I mentioned that John, Catherine, and most of our brand ambassadors and friends, artists from different parts of the world are on their way to Bologna, Italy for Fabriano. Um, we hope to, to get a um, sneak peek of the events tomorrow. Um, and having said that, it's, it means that John will not be joining us for today's live, but we'll have wonderful friends with us to help us take on a journey with colors. We have Buffy from California, and we also have Anna Marie here who will help us uh, manage questions from Facebook and, and in Zoom. Topic for today will be our quinacridones. We have 13 quinacridones, and Buffy will help us well, understand how beautiful these colors are. We're gonna do mixes. And if time permits, and I think we'll, we'll have time, Buffy will also do a demo. So without much ado, take it away, Buffy. Yay. Hi, everybody, welcome. I'm so thankful to be invited to do today because it's on Quinacridones and they are some of my very favorite colors. Um, for those of you who know my core palette, I use some of the quinacridones in my everyday colors, and I love um, finding and unlocking new mixes with them. So I'm going to switch over to my desktop camera and share not only the colors directly, but also some of the color mixes that are my favorites. There's a blog post on the Daniel Smith website called Why We Love Quinacridones. And in it, they're talking a little bit about how they started. So originally the quinacridone colors were developed for automotive paints and Daniel Smith introduced them to the art material market in 1993. So these are, these have been around for a while. They're staining pigments. And so that being said, we've done videos in the past on quinacridones where we swatch them out full strength, but I wanted to share what they look like when you swatch them out as a value scale, because not only in their fullest, most saturated strength are they beautiful colors, but when you water them down, you get these beautiful pastel colors that since it's staining, work so well in your watercolors. I have 10 of the monochrome colors that I'll be swatching today. And then I also wanted to share that they not only come in the tubes, but they also come um, in, there's quite a few of them in the sticks. We have the quinacridone gold, the sienna, the burnt orange. We have the quinacridone red and the quinacridone coral and the burnt scarlet. Oh, I apologize. And the quinacridone violet. So how cool is that? That not only do we have them in the tubes, but so many of them in the sticks. And a quick, um, a quick piece of color mixing is that the quinacridones get along perfectly with the Hansas and the Thalos. So if you're ever wondering what blue to use or what yellow to use when you're mixing the quinacridones, grab your Hansas and grab your Thalos, and then you can just go into a full color exploration and experimentation and find and unlock endless colors. So hopefully I'll get to share some of those with you guys. But first, let's swatch. Matthew, that's the um, ingenious way of keeping your sticks, by the way. Oh yeah, uh, this cool little, it's a marker roll from Jackson's Art. And I found that it really goes well with the sticks. Love it. So this first color here, I'm gonna swatch at full strength and then pull it down. So this is the quinacridone gold. And I'm just gonna slowly add some color. So we can see it's beautiful range. The quinacridone gold is a glowing color. It's wonderful for adding a, a little bit of magic to 
your foliage, for instance, if you splatter some quinacridone gold into passages of trees, maybe um, leaves, just a beautiful color. It's also an amazing color when you're working with earthy colors and you want to have a bright spot. I recently did this and it was all the fun earthy yellows. This is the quinacridone gold and then I mixed it with some of the iridescent gold and it created this amazing shimmery color. So then I dropped it in to this earthy passage and would you look at that how it just brought to life some of the color. Uh, something funny is I posted this online asking people what they saw because I thought well it was fun to explore color but maybe I'll do a painting on it and a friend I grew up with's mom told me it looks like a mess. <laughs> I think that mess was awesome because I discovered the quinacridone gold and the iridescent gold combo. So the next color is quinacridone deep gold. So just like the name suggests, it's going to be a little bit deeper and also it's granulating because we swatched that down. Hopefully we'll see some of that granulation. I'm using a wa Saunders Waterford high white rough. So that way any of the sediment will settle into the valleys and as it dries, we can then look at that. So the next it, can I ask a question? Is the, the deep gold is granulating, but the, the regular gold isn't? Correct. As, uh, oh, as far as, let me just double check that with this wonderful little tool that they have. Uh, oh, I take that back. The quinacridone gold and the quinacridone deep gold are both granulating. Was that Elisa? That's Lori. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you never can stop learning about color. Another color that I'm doing right now that is also granulating, but I like to say low granulating is the quinacridone sienna. This is probably one of my absolute favorite Daniel Smith colors. The color mixes I've unlocked with this color um, really improved my paintings altogether. Buffy, will you tell us the name of that color again? Quinacridone Sienna. Thank you. You're welcome. It works really good too as a replacement for burnt sienna or transparent red oxide. If you're ever painting along and someone's calling out those names, this works really well in place. Oops. This next one is quinacridone burnt orange, another granulating quinacridone. Look at how deep that color is. A word on the quinacridones, um, in my experience, I find that the dry shift is not so bad, meaning that when you first paint it on, it's one color, and then when it dries, it can dry much more lighter. And I found that because these are staining, that you don't have so much of a dry shift. The next color is quinacridone red. This is a purpley red. It's, I like to say it's on the cool side, but it gets along with so many of the other color yellows that I love. This is one of my core colors. I love that it goes into this pink world when it's watered down and how with just a little bit of yellow, you can warm it up to almost like a cadmium red. So that was the red that I chose for my palette. The next one that I'll be swatching is quinacridone coral. A really pretty color. When I look at it, I think of seashells, <clears throat> that pink that you find in the bellies of the seashells. Um, let's see, I think I even have one.
like it has sometimes they'll have that little pink that goes down inside of it. So when this color dries, that's what it reminds me of. We have a question on Facebook from Sue. Okay. Hi, and Sue. she's asking, she's asking if all quins are transparent and staining. Do you know that off the top of your head? Mm. Or should we look I at believe, the info? I believe so, yes. Um, we can check it. Do any of you have this handy? Yeah. Because you can, um, these options will come in our orders. And when you look at these, it has a really great tool where it will show you if it's like a why or a no for whether or not it's granulating, it's opacity. And it'll have a number, it'll have its light fast rating and then also its staining rating. So you can look it up. So for instance, the quinacridone rose is a three, the quinacridone pink is a two, the lilac is a three, the quinacridone is a three. So in summary, they go from low staining to medium staining in general. If we look at the golds, we have a two for the quinacridone gold and the deep gold is a two. So those are low staining. I work with staining pigments a lot because I do a lot of watercolor pouring and so any of you who've tried it will notice that when you have water on the paper and then you're mixing your paint and you're pouring it onto the thing, onto the water, sorry, in the paper. So it can really um, lose its vibrancy and its saturation. So if you're working a lot of wet on wet or watercolor pouring, staining pigments can really help you keep your paintings vivid and vibrant, and beautiful. This next color, thank you, Susan, for the question, is another that's on my core, another favorite color. It's the quinacridone magenta. And it is just a juicy, beautiful purple, purpley red. This color is another really pretty color to splatter into uh, passages. For instance, if you're doing trees, like tree trunk, bark, anything that has dark browns in it, you mix a little bit of this quinacridone magenta into your brown mixes, it really can create the most stunning shadows on your trees. The next mm -hmm. color is quinacridone violet. This one is similar to the quinacridone red, just a little bit bluer to my eye. It is another stunner. Another uh, tip that I can share for playing around with quinacridones is take a quinacridone color and introduce it into a mix with a granulating blue especially these reds. So you mix it in with like an ultramarine or a cobalt or your cerulean and you'll have such pretty colors. Hopefully I'll have time to share one. And as they dry, the colors kind of compete for space. So it's like the quinacridones and the ultramarines or the cobalts, they seem to want to settle on the paper or dry. I wish John was here, he would explain it better, but in my words, it, I call it a color separation where the two colors want to kind of pull apart. And so you might have areas of a wash where it has the blue more and the red more. So a neat effect. This next color will be quinacridone purple. This color is very rich and very dark. It could be a great color to use in dark areas on your florals. For instance, if you were doing some really pretty lavender or lilac flowers and you wanted to grab a shadow color, getting this quinacridone purple. I think another thing I like about the quinacridones is that they're vibrant 
and beautiful and saturated, but when they're mixing with other colors, they're not too dominating. So they, they seem to be really happy mixers. And the last quinacridone that I'll be swatching in this fashion is the quinacridone rose. This color is very interesting. It's somewhat similar in a way to the quinacridone red, but, oops, but it seems to have just a little bit more of that vibrancy for like, you know, doing rose bushes and that kind of thing. I mean, look at that peak. So all the way from the top in the highest saturation, all the way to the bottom, where it's just almost completely watered down pastel, you can see the range of color you're getting just out of the paint on its own. Today, I um, shared this with Ethel. She might be able to um, share it in the chat on Facebook. Yep. And this is my personal dot card that I have as a brand ambassador for Daniel Smith. And what I wanted to share is the colors that I have on it. So I have the quinacridone sienna, the quinacridone red, and the quinacridone magenta. And these are the colors that I use to mix with all of these other colors on my dot card. And I can get some pretty great mixes. So I'm gonna share a couple of my favorites with you right now. And we sent to the chat, uh an image of that, of that swatching sheet. Our guests in Zoom um, can download the image for better viewing. Thank you, Ethel. You're welcome. And I'll try to make I... me... uh, Go ahead, Anna Marie. Oh, I had a question about quinacridone rose. Okay. And I see Raphael also on Zoom is also talking about quinacridone rose. He's saying, it's one of the most interesting and useful quinacridones, especially in mixes. My experience with quinacridone rose is that it does not have a high, as much of a high pigment load. It's actually more of a uh, less dominant color, or even as though it's a little bit gummy. Do any of you have experience with this, or um, about a conversation with quinacridones about quinacridone rose being a less dominant color? Thanks. I, I would say that I, I typically don't use quinacridone rose on its own. I typically use it as a mixer. Um, I don't think that it's overly dominant. I think that it's a, a medium as far as mixing goes, meaning that for instance, raw sienna light is, has a very low tinting strength, mixing strength. So when you're painting with raw sienna light, another favorite color, <laughs> um, I tend to go through the tube so fast because I require so much of it. Um, still worth buying a couple tubes though, because it's the most beautiful <laughs> yellow, I think. But with the chronocronone rose, I, I do a lot of mixes with it. I don't know if anyone else has some input but if anyone else wants to share while they're sharing, I'm gonna mix up some French ultramarine and the quinacridone rose to swatch it out right here. I think Buffy, you hit on the vocabulary I was lacking, which was low tinting strength. Thank you. You're welcome, yeah. Yeah, there's so much to learn and unlock. I feel like um, any of you who've ever played video games, you know, you feel like you level up sometimes, like you'll have a color and you think you understand it, you'll be using it. And then all of a sudden you'll happen upon a mix or a way of using it you never thought of before. And I just, you know, I think of, oh, I've, I've just leveled up with this color. Just, they all have their secrets and demos like this, where we um, have different artists share, it's fascinating to me because um, I, I learn something every time. So I'm going to do about 50-50 of the Chronocardone Rose and the French Ultra Marine. Uh, for one thing, isn't that pretty? Just on its own, it's pretty. But now I'm going to go ahead 
and I'm just gonna paint this out. And then I'm gonna let it be and let it dry to be able to share how the colors will pull. I don't know exactly how John worded it, but I last week he worded something about what causes granulation. And he was saying that when we add the water and the water pulls it apart, that that's how that granulation will happen. So if you have a granulate and you just watch it full strength, it's going to look one way. But if you have one and you wash it out, that's when you get to see those color separations and the granulation. So I'm gonna let the water move a little bit and then I'll let it be. And we'll see how that one dries. So I took 50-50, the Quinn Rose and some French Ultramarine created a pretty purple. And we're gonna see if that stays just a solid color or, or what it will do. One other way to test for color separation is you can take a line of color and then pull it down and out with some water. And oftentimes this is one of my favorite ways to swatch when I'm looking for those color separations. Because oftentimes with that extra water, it'll really start to pull apart and you'll be able to see the different colors. I'm gonna do another mix of the quinacridone sienna, which is another favorite color that I mentioned. And I wanna show you its versatility for color mixing. So I mentioned the thalos earlier. So I'm gonna put a little bit of the thalo turquoise into the quinacridones. Now the quinacridones we talked about kind of having a, a medium mixing strength and the thalos are dominant. So when you're mixing a dominant thalo color, a little itty bit goes a long way. So if you've loaded your brush up, go ahead and rinse it off. <laughs> and you'll want to just take a little bit, I mean, just a little tiny bit on the tip of your brush to get that color shift. I'm gonna add that on there. See how it immediately turned it to just this beautiful brown? Is that amazing? Look at that. If I wanna take it more to a little bit more umber, I can add just a little bit more of the turquoise. If I want to take it to more of a red brown, I can just add some more sienna. Isn't that beautiful? Just two colors and I have three versions of brown. And you can mix it to the color of brown you like. We all see color a little bit differently. So oftentimes we'll think of, oh, well, I want to use a color because this artist is using it. But what about mixing up and finding your own colors? Look at how pretty they water down also. So when I do the thalo turquoise or any of the thalos with the chronocridones, I get this incredible variation. I'm gonna show you the same thing, but how to get grays with just that same color, that quinacridone sienna. So again, I'm gonna take some of the sienna, a little bit of water, and this time I'm gonna use some phthalo blue red shape instead of the turquoise. Thalo blue red shade, again, you just need a little itty bit to start shifting the color. So I just take a little bit at a time because if I do too much, I'm afraid it'll overpower the wash and I'll have to start over. So see how with the thalo blue, I got so many colors of brown again. Is that cool? Um, so if I keep going, what color do you think it'll be? I mean, look at that. That's wow. This is what excites me about color mixing is that you can sit here, look at how many browns I found. I'm gonna keep going. Somebody guessed black. 
that color looks kind of ugly. Let's check it out. <laughs> okay, so there's a kind of a green, gray, brown. I don't know. Let's keep going. Blue. Do you do you mind try watering that down and seeing what it looks like in a pastel? Because oh, it's, sure. it's not attractive. You're saying in the darkest value, maybe it, it has something we're interested in in the lighter values also. Yes, I'll do that. Look at that beautiful gray, like a green gray almost, huh? It's beautiful. I'm gonna keep going though with some little bit more of the blue because it keeps shifting. I feel Look like a that. color like that allows the other colors to sing so beautifully. Yes. So look at that variation of colors now that I was able to get with those two. I also wanted to share that Quinacridone Gold Mix because I really think that that one was worth uh, talking about. So we have this really cool color by Daniel Smith, this iridescent gold. And uh, let me share what it looks like. So it's just a shiny, I believe it has, I believe the iridescence comes from mica, but I don't, um, if any of you know for sure, please help me with that. So you have this really pretty color, right? But then when you go to put it, on your paper, look at it. it's just it's a, a kind of a transparent, right? It's it's just the slightest hue. So then when you go and you add some quinacridone gold, now we're getting into that era of gold that we think of, cartoon gold. Isn't that cool? Then if we go and we add like a super granulator, like let's look at what it would look like with some enviro-friendly brown iron oxide. Um, if you guys haven't tried this color yet, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's enviro-friendly and I like to call it the French ultramarine of brown because it's super granulating. It has a neat, way of shifting color uh, and granulating color. So if I let these dry now, the granulation of the brown iron oxide is going to start to settle while that mica is going to have, or I'm sorry, the, ir the iridescence of the gold will have a shimmer. So you can just imagine how you can add this to your landscapes to have passages that just really sing. For instance, imagine if you had a super earthy, kind of toned, kind of mute landscape, and then you just have these bright little color pops in there just for little emphasis areas or trying to take the eye to your focal point on your painting. So now it's starting to dry. I'm going to use my dryer and just, it's already done a lot of it separating. So I'm just going to have my dryer on it for a quick second. I have two bottles of Daniel Smith gold powder. Does anybody know anything about them? Um, Are I'm you in California? Because we could have a swatch party. <laughs> <laughs> I have not gotten to play with the powders yet. Anna Marie, have you? I'm not supposed to talk about it. <laughs> uh, we're not, uh, but I don't. I don't know about the powder, and I haven't seen the the front of that image yet. So no, of the bottle that you're showing me. So that's new to me. I'm not this is 
this this bottle is like 20 years old. Yeah, I was wondering. Um, John mentioned them, you know, uh, a few months back, as I recall, but it was uh, kind of non-committal, as I recall, on having them available. I mean, I've played around with the powders from um, England, but you know, they're very cool, but, and um, some others, but they are not color fast and, you know, anyway. I just never used them because I didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> Go ahead, I, I, Yes, I've used powders. And the trick with powders I is you, you want to- Yeah, if I get a pass, I can, I can be so- we have a confusion. You want to uh, float them in a very thin liquid. The thinner, the better, because it's usually micas and they want to dry flat. And that's how you get the reflective quality out of them. Oh, interesting. And Did that, yes. The wonderful thing about watercolors, and if it's a watercolor powder, is that it can be from the 70s, it can be 100 years old, yeah. and it'll still work. Like there is no expiration date. I would still check light fastness on other brands to make sure that yeah. it's quality. Um, but you can revive a watercolor forever. Yeah, so I, did still use I did a lot. I did a lot. They are not. I'm talking um, about powder. I, I use both um, gum arabic and water, and they're really fun. But they are not light fast. It was kind of sad. Mm. Okay, we're not talking about powders. These are powders from England. Well, like I said, okay. if any of you are in the California area, we could uh, play with those powders for sure. <laughs> I haven't gotten to try them yet. Sounds, I would be sprinkling them. So if I had them, I would do like a wet wash and I would do, I would sprinkle it in like sea salt and see what it would do. That would be so well, I could do that. Play. I could do that for next week, maybe. Yes. I've been yeah. working on a King Tut exhibit. I've been working on a King Tut painting and I've been using some of the gold powders uh, for the, um, the gold in the, uh, in the death mask. And they're wonderful, that's what I wanna say. I've been using several different other golds and, and bronzes and they work really well, surprisingly with um, cobalt blue. Cobalt blue oh. is, uh, you know, I mean, in the Daniel Smith, um, well, anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. And it's turning out lovely, Good. surprisingly. Thank you for sharing about that. You've definitely piqued my interest and uh, I'll be trying to track some down. So just wanted to share how this dried. And I don't know if you can see that well on camera. I'll try and take a close-up photo of it to share and send to Ethel. But if you look very closely, the blue of the ultramarine settles down in the hills and valleys of the of the paper while the Knockerdone Rose still sits on top. And over here, you can see how dynamic this would look, say on a rose petal, for instance, how pretty these beautiful blends could be. And then lastly, for any of you that didn't get to watch this live and are watching the playback, um, you can rewind this video about 10 minutes when all these were perfectly wet and then look fast forward and you can see the dry shift or lack thereof. I think that's one of the most important things to learn when you're painting is how much paint to use to be able to get your painting to look beautiful, not only wet, but also dry. I don't know if any of you've had that issue, but it can be, yeah. Um, yeah. So I just love these colors. And the other article I wanted Ethel to share in the mm -hmm. chat box, if you don't mind. Um, and oh yes, Anna Maria, I just saw, as far as light fastness, fastness goes, it is very helpful to test for yourself. Um, the comparing the quinacridone colors for florals, and they have nine colors here swatched out. And they were talking about, um, they're light fast, they're durable, highly pigmented, and they're very transparent. Some of them are non-granulating. We talked about that at the beginning of the video. And they have either an excellent 100 plus years or very good 100 years for light fastness. Wow. So I also believe in um, the statement here, I, I'm in agreement where it says that they're perfect for glazing. 
So because they're highly transparent staining um, colors, you think of it kind of like stained glass. So each layer, you're you're laying another layer of glass. So um, for those of you that want a quick hack for painting with multiple glazes, where you're doing very many layers, is you want to go um, more towards your lot, your staining, I'm sorry, your transparent colors, not your opaque and your non-granulating colors. So non-granulating transparent colors work better for glazing than your opaque granulating colors. You wanna save your opaque granulating colors for the last layers, if you're doing multiple layers. So anyways, this is another great article talking about the different quinacridones used for florals. Another ambassador, um, Allison Pinto, she does some beautiful florals and I believe she also yes. uses the quinacridones. And um, it even goes into detail with these really sweet little color story descriptions of each color. So if you wanna do some more reading on the individual colors, you can go on these beautiful blogs on Daniel Smith. You can also put in the search engine the name of the color and find it in their color stories. If you haven't researched color on the Daniel Smith website, please try that today. It is extensive. It's full of resources. It's it's just a truly amazing site of the information that they they as a manufacturer are giving us as the artist. So we're only limited <laughs> by how much time we're putting into our swatching and are diving deeper into color. So speaking of florals, I thought it might be fun to do a quick demo. Um, this is a photograph on pexels.com by Ivan Samkov. It's a great uh, website to find imagery if you just wanna practice your watercolors. Practice your drawing. Buffy? Many of the, yes? Um, there's a comment here, actually Stacy sent us as a direct message. Did you share earlier a, um, a tube of iridescent gold or which tube is that? Yes, it was iridescent gold. Okay. Yes. I just, as you can, as you can tell, I'm going through it. All right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, maybe uh, on another. On Alex's bed. Oh, what is this? Oh. Maybe on another um, demo in the future when we're playing with iridescence, I can share a fun sand recipe I have for mm. that. I know some of you, um, like I, I heard Belle, uh, Belle having King Gold, um, one of our old products perhaps. This was before and I saw Stacy holding another bottle of, um, I think she showed silver. So perhaps when in our next session or future sessions with John, I'm sure John would then again talk about kinecridones or iridescence. Uh, feel free to de direct message or you could even um, just unmute your, unmute your mic and share about your experience with the iridescence. But perhaps for today's session, it's considered bonus because Buffy, we have Buffy did a color swatch and mix this and now we will have a demo. Just going to do, thank you, Ethel. I'm just going to do a really sloppy, we're going to call it stylized, okay, guys? <laughs> Since we're here for time, I'm just going to do a quick little sloppy flowers. Um, we can call them loose florals. How about that? <laughs> Sometimes I think having some sloppy um, drawings can be a lot of fun because it kind of takes the pressure off <laughs> of your painting. You can be expressive and just really explore color. For instance, if this was a painting that I was going to do for, you know, a showpiece or whatnot, I might do something like this, just an a la prima quick paint, just to be able to be expressive and play with it and get to know it a little bit before I tackle 
a really complicated image. Buffy, just before you start coloring, so there's um, a message from Stacy. Do you have a swatch there of kinecridone gold uh, that's already like dried? And we could, the cam is on spotlight. She, she's, she just wants to see the dried swatch, a closer look of it. I think she's referring to this. So right here is the quinacridone gold. And then this is it mixed with that or with that iridescent gold. I'm sorry, this is the quinacridone gold. This is the iridescent gold. And this is what it looks like mixed together to have, let's see if I can get it. So you can see that mica sitting there creating that shine. So yeah, that's the quinacridone gold. And then I believe my swatch sheet is nearly dry. I can give it a little help. So here is your quinacridone gold and your quinacridone deep gold dried. And here it is mixed with that iridescent gold and then the enviro-friendly brown. So you can see just how pretty, what, how glowing it is. I also have, this is gonna show you how big of a color nerd I am. <laughs> So I also have the Quinn Gold next to some other colors. So this is your Quinn Gold next to your transparent yellow oxide, raw sienna, raw sienna light, your nickel azo yellow, um, your isoindoline, is that how you say it, yellow? Lemon yellow and Hansa yellow. So you can see how much it glows. It has a very... Um, a very, almost like a golden raw sienna, I guess I would describe it. And then also here, you can see it mixed with, each of these were done mixing with the same colors, the quinacridone sienna, the quinacridone red, the quinacridone magenta, the thalo turquoise, and the thalo blue red shade. So you can see that you can get very similar colors, right? Similar mixes. But the quinacridone gold is just a little extra, a little extra vibrant. It just, it's, it's kind of a stunner. Um, for any of you who've used other manufacturers, it's very similar to like the transparent yellow color, how it's just bright and bold in your face. So um, I recommend getting yourself a, a color book where you can start, um, you know, studying and exploring color and really diving into it. Um, like this was a study I did trying to pick which enviro-friendly color I was gonna add to my palette. So I went through and, and studied them all, so. Buffy. Yes? Uh, how does uh, Queen Gold uh, come up against um, like Indian Yellow or New Gamboge? Hi, Ian, I recognize that voice. <laughs> Let's see, I don't have either of those in my current study. Uh, here is the Quinn Deep Gold compared to a Mars Yellow. And the Mars Yellow could be kind of in that world, but, but yeah, I, I apologize. I just don't have those colors with me, Ian. All right. Buffy, is that a pre-made book? Is that a pre-made book? Uh, one of the schools I was teaching at got a donation and the director said, would you like to go through the donation and see if you'd like anything? So this was a Liberté watercolor sketchbook. And uh, just by the feel of it, it's very, very um, aged. And it's 50% cotton, 50% man-made fibers. It doesn't state what kind 
I'm sorry, it was paper made in France by Arches Paper Mill. <laughs> so I don't know the whole story. Um, the paper has some sizing issues. It's very soft, almost like a cloth when you touch it, but it's perfect for just this very purpose, color swatching. And here's a tip. If you have any old paper or paper that's kind of gone to the pot because of aging or sizing issues, here's a tip. Do a painting or color swatching on it. And if it looks good on this paper, think about how good it's going to look on high quality, brand new paper. All right, so back to my quick demo. Just gonna do a quick push and pull of some of these colors. Here, just gonna play with the colors a little bit. Let's start with a little bit of, let's see. I think I'll start with just a little bit of Quinn Red. You have little ones saying hello to your Buffy um, with Besnick. Oh, can you put them on spotlight? Sure. Say hello. Hi. <laughs> hello. Hi. I think it's only on your hi. Hi. Hi, guys. Yeah, hi. Buffy, hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Besnick. Oh, will you introduce your littles to us, please? Yeah, this is my oh, yes. daughter's enjoying the uh, session. Oh, oh nice to meet you all. This is oh, Alina, the bigger one, and Nina. Hi, Alina. Hi, Nina. <laughs> hi, Alina. Hi, Nina. Hi. Oh, you'll have to have Besnick. You'll have to paint some roses for me or draw some flowers for me and send them, okay? Okay, no problem. Okay. We'll do it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. How sweet. So I put a little bit of quinacridone red, and I'm going to take a little bit of the quinacridone rose. And we're just going to see how these colors work to add a little variation and alternation to our color world. Let's, let's just mix them all. Why don't we? Why don't we play with it? Put a little bit of the lilac. A little bit of the violet. Let's get crazy, guys. And let's do a little bit of that purple. So I'll lay a little bit of color down, and then I'll just use a wet angle shader brush. And I'll start to pull some of that color out. And it could be so relaxing and fun to watch how these colors spread and how you can somewhat quickly start to define your flowers. Doesn't take a whole lot of information to say pretty rose, right? Just what if we took a little bit of that sienna and started switching over go into more of a warm area here. I'm gonna go ahead and do a warmer rose here. Maybe I'll do a little bit, you know what? I'll do a little bit of the Quinn Deep Gold. Let's just see how some of these colors get along together. And a little bit of the Quinn Gold. And now we can start blending those out. Imagine doing something like this, like on a, a little birthday card for somebody, just sending a little thoughtful remembrance to someone. What if we went down and did more of like a fire engine red? So I'm gonna take some of the quinacridone red and I'm going to add a little bit of the quinacridone orange. Look at that. It's almost like a cadmium now. And I'm going to go ahead and mix that up. Maybe I'll go more yellow now to give it that color shift, more of a yellow rose. And we'll just go pure yellow. I 
I think one of my favorite things about the quinacridones is how uh, well they mix with others, but also how well they mix with water. They just get these beautiful um, soft blends. So another mix that I really, really like is you take some quinacridone sienna and you add the thalo turquoise and you keep adding a little bit, remember a little bit at a time because it's such a dominant color and check this out. We're gonna go ahead and give, we're gonna play with that color. I don't care if it mixes right in. I could add a little bit more turquoise to get it a little bit more colorful. We'll just go ahead. Blend these out. Isn't that a beautiful mix how you can take the quinacridone sienna and shift it with the thalo turquoise into all these really pretty greens and green brown colors. It's also worth pointing out how much more vibrantly the warms are popping forward and they have something to play off of now with those dark muted greens. Yes, agreed. It, uh, you know, you're, you're, another thing about doing these wet studies is that you can play with the colors and say, oh, I want my roses to be more pink and, and purple, or I want them to be more yellows. You could take some thalo blue red, red shade, put that in there and get a whole nother kind of color going. So the all a prima wet or all at once method of painting is that you go very, you don't have to go fast, but you go all at once. So you're painting across the page. You're not too worried if things are mixing or running together. And it's, uh, for me, it's kind of like a, a therapy almost, like an art therapy, <laughs> because it's just so freeing. I can be completely expressive and not worry too much about getting every last thing perfect. I wonder if any of you um, paint this way, if you ever just do little color studies like this and see how the colors get along on the paper. I wanted to do one more thing. I'm gonna get this up here kind of wet. And then I'm gonna take that gold color I was talking about earlier. Let's see. Do a couple little bursts of that. And just watch it spread in that background, really pretty. There's one last thing I wanted to show you. I think this is representative enough of a quick little rose study. But I wanted to show you one more thing. Do we have a couple more minutes left? Yes, we have we have five minutes. Okay, perfect. I'm gonna dry a portion. I want to show you how the quinacridones lift because that's important to know in watercolor, because oftentimes we might get carried away <laughs> and might have an area we want to bring back. So I'm gonna dry it really quick and then share. While she's using her hair dryer, is, that, is it okay if I take a moment and share something I found? Sure. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> I was at my local art supply store. I was visiting Nebraska, and there's a Gomez Art Supply in Lincoln. And they always forget that they have dot cards. And I ask, and they're like, no, we don't have anything like that. And then I'm like, actually, can you check? They're right there behind you. And they, I, they found this one right here, which is a quinacridone dot card. And I look at the bottom and I see it's actually published in 2012. So it's over a decade old. I, I love that they still had it, but I didn't realize that uh, Daniel Smith had made a quinacridone dot card and just realizing, oh, now I get to paint it through and go through the same process that Buffy was presenting here as well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if Daniel Smith has released new quinacridone since 2012. So I need to look into that, but I was pretty excited to find this and then 
for discussing that today. Um, so yes, there are new kins. Um, in total, we now have 13. Like then, addition to this, we have, I think we don't have, we didn't have Kinokidon Lila back then. That's 13. Yeah, we have 13 now. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Buffy, Laurie says, uh, you inspired her to try some of Rose paintings. Hmm. That makes this whole day worth it. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I had a stencil picked out that I wanted to share, but in the chaos of all this color swatching, <laughs> I seem to have misplaced it. <laughs> so I'm gonna use this one. This one is a um, Tim Holtz, Jim Holtz, Tim Holtz. And I'm just gonna take um, a toothbrush and this is the fastest way I think to show how things will lift. So here it is right now. I'm gonna lay this over it. I'll go right there. It's gonna take some water and I'm gonna do a little bit of a lift. My water is a little bit dirty, so you might wanna pick a little bit cleaner water, but we're so short on time. So you could lift that those quinacridones right off, kind of neat. Do one right here. Lifts right off. Lifts right off. So you could really get. Um, some lifting done. Another cool thing about lifts, I think we have like one more minute, is you could even use some tape and tape off an area that you want to lift and do it that way. No, no, my son has a question. He's, okay. uh, he saw you put the tape down and he's like, oh, don't use that type of paint. It takes off the tape and the paper. Is, is that a regular tape or is that a, a different type? Oh, tell your son hello for me. <laughs> Hi, sweetheart. We should have more kids on this show. It makes it so much more rewarding. Hello, sweetheart. Hi, hold on, let me real quick. Hey, babe. <laughs> Hello, sweetheart. Thank you for your question. You wanted to know what kind of tape it was, right? So yes, this is scotch tape. Um, I'll tell you a trick. Uh, if your paintings are like, like 11 by 14 or smaller, and you're using 140 pound paper, you can actually tape the sides with scotch tape. Usually it'll work. It'll save you so much money on the um, you know, the artist takes a little bit more, but yeah, I'll put scotch tape right on my painting and find a passage that I want to lift, or let's say I wanted to put a little stem there. I could even do a little lift and put some stems in. You want to do it when the paper, of course, is completely dry, but I thought just to show you guys that not only are these colors vibrant, saturated, staining, and incredibly beautiful, but they'll lift. <laughs> I mean, that is just so cool to me. So um, thank you, Ethel and John, for inviting me to share today. I hope you guys enjoyed this um, small demo. And uh, before we go, we'd love to hear any of your favorite chronochrome colors or your mixes. Thank you, Buffy. Um, you've always been very 
open and generous when it comes to sharing your process. Um, I wonder if for the demo today, the artwork, um, if you could share that on your Instagram or Facebook, and we'll be happy to repost. Sure, um, definitely. And, and I was just about to ask, do you have any workshops coming up on schedule? You may have friends here who would like to sign up. Uh, I don't have any currently um, with the Daniel Smith demos, but I do have, if you go to my website, which is www.watercolorpour.com. I have two special events coming up in May. If any of you guys would like to come, I could really use some familiar faces on the other side. They're both online. The first one is with Opus Art Materials in May. I believe it is May 27th. Um, and it will be an hour and a half demo. And it's a free event, so really excited. There was about, I think they had 500 tickets and there's around 300 remaining. So we would just love to fill that one up. And then May 21st, which is a Sunday, I'll be doing a, a floral demo with Miami Watercolor Society. So, um, and that one um, is open to members and non-members. So I'd love to see you guys there. Thank you for asking that. Hey, we pasted in the chat on Zoom and on Facebook your website uh, so that our friends can just scan through more info about the upcoming activities. Thank you again, Buffy, as well as Anna Marie. And for those who help um, provide answers for questions from fellow artists here, tomorrow we will have Sylvia Mong from Costa Rica and we'll also have John. So don't miss it. We'll see you guys tomorrow at 10 30. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Bye. Bye, for Bye. Now. Bye everyone. Take care, all. Bye.